Well, we'll make a, a start this morning. Uh, I'm John Rawlinson. I'm the general manager of the Banner of Truth, uh, based in Edinburgh in the UK. And uh, I'd like to welcome you all here this morning to this event. Uh, we're very privileged uh, to have two gentlemen with us, I'm sure you'll all recognise. Uh, so, the Reverend Ian Murray and Dr. John MacArthur. And we're very happy to have you, and we're hoping to learn this morning from your experience. And the subject that we're looking at today uh, is the matter of reading. Uh, what books to read, how you should read, the importance of reading. Now, many of you I know are students here at the seminary, uh, and you're going to be going out into the ministry. And so what we're hoping to do today uh, is to provide information for you that will help you as you seek to minister to others. Now, if you were in Ian Murray's session yesterday, you would have heard Ian say and talk about the importance of reading the Scriptures. And what we're going to be doing this morning is talking about other books. But what I don't want you to do is to think that we're promoting the reading of books above the promoting of the reading of Scripture. Because the reading of Scripture has to have the primate place. I know one of Ian's favorite authors is a man called J.C. Ryle. And J.C. Ryle had this to say, and I'll just read this to you. He said, next to praying, there is nothing so important in practical religion as Bible reading. God has mercifully given us a book which is able to make us wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. As I'm sure you'll know he's quoting to Timothy. By reading that book, we may learn what to believe, what to be, and what to do. How to live with comfort and how to die in peace. Happy is that man who possesses a Bible. Happier still is he who reads it. Happiest of all is he who not only reads it, but obeys it and makes it the rule of his faith and practice. Now, we're going to be looking at books other than the scriptures this morning, but I thought it was worth emphasizing that you need to be reading the Bible. We should have some time later on to take some questions. So as we're going through this morning, you might like to think at the back of your mind if you've got any particular questions you'd like to raise. Uh, and when we do get to the question session, we would ask you uh, to step up to the microphone, please, so that people can hear your questions. So I'd like to start off this morning and ask uh, two gentlemen uh, if you could tell us a little bit about why you feel reading is important for the minister. What's the importance of reading? Perhaps Ian, you might like to start off. Would you like to start, John? <laughs> uh, the, the younger man will start, but not by far. Uh, look, um, um, I, I couldn't survive without reading. I, I have a, um, an, a really a voracious appetite for truth and understanding and insight and experience. Um, I, I cannot survive without reading. Every chair in my house, whether it's a, the kitchen chair where I sit down to eat or the chair in the den where I sit down to, uh, to read or my study or the bedroom, everywhere there are books. Uh, one of the things that has been a blessing to me is the Lord has never allowed me to, to leave Grace Church. So they've already heard everything I know. And, and I have to continually take in new understandings uh, in, in order to not be stale and to be repeating myself all the time. But even if that weren't true, I remember Dick Mayhew always used to say, you're the most curious person I have ever met. But I'm not really particularly curious about everything, but I am um, relentlessly curious about every possible insight I can have into the Word of God. I, don't, I doubt that, uh, I mean, I may be wrong about it, but I doubt that there's anyone more interested in the preaching this week than I have been. I, I, I feel like I'm, I feel like I'm uh, being bathed in, in an understanding of divine truth just hearing these men. It is my highest joy. 
So I'm not interested in reading things that attack the scripture. I'm not interested in that at all. I, I'm not interested in reading error. I, I want to live in Psalm 1. I don't want to sit in the seat of scoffers. I don't find any benefit to that. I don't want anybody undermining my convictions. I don't need that. But anyone that helps me understand the scripture or helps me understand the application of the scripture in a life and a ministry um, just continually enriches me. Um, uh, maybe that's sufficient at this point, but what that does for me is it drives me in the direction of commentaries, books on theology, and biographies of men who have been faithful, men and women. And th those are the, that, that's, the, that's the area in which I find most of my reading, and of course that makes me um, indebted to Banner because that's the kind of thing that, that you all have published through the years. Thank you, John. I've woken up a bit now. <laughs> <laughs> well, my life has really been bound up with a sort of rediscovery of books in some ways. I was brought up in a liberal Presbyterian church and converted when I was 17. Uh, and an old lady in the church one day gave me a copy of a book I'd never seen or heard of and it was the Westminster Confession of Faith. Well, now that's a denomination to which the church belonged. You would think people knew it or at least have heard of it. No, no, they had not heard of it. So when I started to read it, that was an eye-opener. I mean, it, why were these things so unspoken and unknown? So from rediscovering that book, it really led on to other books. And one of the things that books do for us, they they put us into the context of where we're living now and how history has become what it is, where churches have come from, where some of them are going to. Um, th they bring a flood of light on many things. One of the books that helped me most when I was young was Spurgeon's um, Commenting on Commentaries. Uh, it only, of course, goes up to his lifetime, but it goes up to uh, 1880s. And Spurgeon covers what he thinks are the best books on parts of scripture. And when we were young, and to a certain extent still today, many of those books were just unavailable. And yet he, he gave them different scores. The bottom score was to say that it's good for housemaids for lighting fires. <laughs> <laughs> but, but the top score, he said, you know, make sure you get this book. Sell your bed to get this book. And well, for a young man, that's very helpful. And we... Uh, and I suppose our initial publications with Banner were guided often by Spurgeon's counsel. I, I, I just, I think that books open worlds to us. They, 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 they are, and it's, it's been a wonderful thing how books have been rediscovered. You know, Whitfield talks about um, that they were rediscovered in the 18th century. The Puritans at the end, 1700, Puritans were going out of fashion. And people thought it was all over. But the books were still there. And then 30, 40 years later, people discovered the books and began to say, well, wh wh who were these men and what did they teach? Yes, so, John? Okay. Thank you. Um, a number of men that I meet through my work uh, who are in the ministry, um, when I talk to them, they, they say, you know, sometimes it's difficult to find time to read. And obviously, you know, there's a pressure of preparing for maybe two or three sermons a week. Um, but perhaps, Ian, I could address this to you. Uh, a lot of what you've written has been historical in nature, um, biographical and historical. Um, could you tell us perhaps a little bit why you feel it's so important uh, that men in the ministry should be reading things that are historical, why it's important they should be reading things that are biographical? Well, Dr. Lloyd-Jones used to say that it would it were, there were good biographical books, and he read them to humble him. When he read, you know, Whitfield and Payson and Edwards, he felt how little he had done. And it is true that uh, the best of men have done very little. And good biographies not only encourage us, but they do keep us humble, and they give us a, a greater ambition and a vision of what we should be. They they do that, don't they? And all the all the good biographies do that. There's another point to that question? That's, that's fine. Um, 
th there's also things which are perhaps more recent history, and there's a, a particular book I know last year, Dr. MacArthur, that you were quite um, impressed with. It's this little book down there, The Sad Departure. Um, it, would you like to say a few words about that book and the importance of that and why it was you yeah, were recommending uh, people to read when, it? When, when uh, we went over to Scotland to spend some time with, uh, with uh, Gene and uh, Ian, uh, he gave me an assignment when I first arrived. He gave me this in a pre-publication form and asked me to read it and do a review. And uh, I think I got a little carried away in the review. <laughs> but uh, this um, subtitle says it all, Why We Could Not Stay in the Church of Scotland. And my, my comment on this was so, I was struck by the fact that here were, here were faithful men in churches, in the Church of Scotland, who over the issue of homosexuality left the Church of Scotland. But I remember writing, why was it homosexuality that drove them out of the Church of Scotland and not a denial of biblical inerrancy or a denial of biblical Christology? Uh, there was at, at one time in my own mind, a, a, I mean, a, a sense of gratitude that they that they didn't remain a part of something that defective, but my conviction was that maybe they should have left when, when the big issues were being assaulted. But again, th this, this was a very moving book. I, I, I would really highly recommend this book. It's extremely well written. Um, it is a warning. It, it is a warning to us to be faithful, and it, it deals with sometimes the, the high price of faithfulness. Uh, again, Ian has, uh, and this is David Randall, but Ian has through the years written many, many books that have addressed the issue. Evangelicalism Divided was a, a monumental read for me because I lived through that. I mean, I lived my life through all of that that was going on. Um, the, the, the last section of the second volume of Lloyd Jones' biography really unpacked the the early years of my life in ministry over the Billy Graham issue, cooperative evangelism, tremendously significant history that helped me hold on to my convictions in in what was a fast capitulating kind of evangelicalism or neo-evangelicalism. So um, we need um, we need men who have been faithful in the past to, to that, that's our brotherhood. And they're not here anymore, but we, we need to stand with them and we learn from them when they were in the midst of those fights. So uh, I, I would highly recommend this. This is a warning. You know, I, somebody asked me yesterday, what, what are the main lessons of the Reformation? And I don't know that this would be, you know, what everybody would say, but for me, there are two main lessons in the Reformation. One lesson is that evil can become massively entrenched, sophisticated, and complex, uh, and, and so powerful that it literally dominates a culture and a history for a millennium. The second lesson is that God can triumph over that evil through a handful of men. Imagine the massive, massive complexity and power of the Roman Catholic system that began to be overthrown by a handful of men. Uh, and I don't, I don't want you men to forget that, that God uses a few faithful men to triumph over evil. And when you read good history, you're seeing history change as the Spirit of God anoints and uses these men. And it, it, it reminds us again that we may not think that, and we, as he said, we are humbled in the, in the reading of these biographies. And usually the men whose biographies we're reading were humble men. But we're humbled by reading that. And yet at the same time, um, they were men that are sort of the mountain peaks of history. Um, and they remind us that God can do a mighty work through a humble and faithful man once you deviate from faithfulness to the truth, you're set aside from that kind of usefulness. Can I just add a word on this book? Uh, you know, 
Hold the mic up. Good. Uh, when, 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 when there's real opposition to a book or an author, the, 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 off the usual trick is just ignore it. You know, B.B. Warfield in the 1930s and before that, it couldn't be answered on many points in which he was defending scripture. The way to treat him was simply to ignore him. Don't, don't review him, don't give attention to him. Well, this little book, on the, it, it, it's a local issue in a way. It's about the Church of Scotland, as, as John has said. But since it, since it was published, it hardly had a whisper said about it in Scotland. The, re, the reviewers just missed it. The, the Church of Scotland wouldn't touch it. <laughs> but this was the providence of God that John happened to be in Scotland about that time. He kindly looked at it. And here, uh, to the surprise of the people who say, oh, just ignore it, here's someone on the other side of the world saying, this is an important book. So that really was used. People, people, it opened people's eyes. But it is the trick, isn't it? Just to ignore something. If you don't, don't believe it, just don't make any comment at all. So, yeah. And in that connection, can I just mention this little paperback on apostasy? John Owen has a wonderful volume on apostasy. This is an abridgment of it. What causes apostasy? Um, it's, it's very discriminating, and this is a, a, a small read. You, you, can, you mentioned get the big volume, and some of you have got it. But if you haven't, that's a good place to start with John Owen on apostasy. Yeah, it. I, I would just add as a general word, Banner's books are theologically sound. They are devotionally rich, but they are also they're written for those who are soldiers for those who are warriors for the truth. Uh, that's what comes through everything. Uh, deep devotion to the truth. And uh, history comes alongside all of this theology and, and some of the devotional things. Um, and I think that, that richness in the Banner books, uh, you know, I, I, you guys are kind enough, John, to send me books. And I'm trying to keep up with the, re <laughs> with the reading of the books. And I go from uh, Mark Jones' wonderful book on knowing Christ, uh, just every chapter, um, just uh, deep insights into the person of Christ, to, to reading, you know, J.C. Ryle, the wonderful story in history, and then bouncing off to the doctrine of justification with Buchanan, and there's some devotional, and there's some biographical, and there's some theology, and, and that's what you get with Banner. But, it, it, but it, it's synergistic because it, it all... It, it, it all works together to help us um, on all those levels. Yeah, thank you. Um, some years ago, I was sitting on a, a bus in Edinburgh on the way home, and I was reading a book, and uh, an American lady got onto the bus and sat down next to me, and I won't attempt to give you her accent, but she looked across, <laughs> <coughs> uh, and she looked at what I was reading, and she nudged me and said, hey, you're reading Our Greatest Philosopher. And I looked at her and I said, I think I'm reading probably one of your greatest theologians. Um, and of course, she was referring to Jonathan Edwards. And there's been a real resurgence in recent years in the States in Ed Edwards' studies. Um, Ian, maybe you could say a few words about Edwards. We, we know you wrote a, a biography of him. Uh, but perhaps you could talk a bit more about his writings as well and the works of Edwards. Well... <laughs> Edwards has played a real part in the rediscovery of Puritans and so on in the last 50 years. Um, he, he was ministering, wasn't he, in the 1720s, 1750s. Uh, it, it was a period of general decline in Europe and in New England too. Um, and Edwards was restating the old Reformed and Puritan convictions, put them, put them in a new dress, uh, in the midst of all that came the Great Awakening, which is now uh, kind of overlooked by a lot of modern writers. But Edwards was many-sided. He was an evangelist. He was a theologian. Uh, his books have uh, just given us an immense amount of valuable material. We, we printed years ago uh, the two volumes of Edwards' works, not terribly presentable, the print is a bit small, but they've had a huge circulation. And the, the, since we started, then Yale have started printing, and the Yale volumes go to 23 or 24 volumes now. M the, the cream of all that Yale have done, has done 
is all in these two volumes. And if your eyesight is reasonably good, and we all studied these were the copies, uh, this was actually the copy that McChain used when he was young. So um, seriously, uh, for two volumes of packed with valuable material, um, the Edwards is a, is a great thing. Yeah, just to add a little bit of a disclaimer on that, read Murray on Edwards and don't waste your time with Marsden on Edwards. Uh, that is a painful experience. Uh, it is painful for two reasons. One, it is, and it is just a long running, rambling uh, list of details with virtually zero theological comment. I mean, you wouldn't know anything about whether or not the author either understood, uh, agreed with, or disagreed with um, Edwards. So there, there's, there's very little help there. What I love about Ian is he cannot keep his theology out of his biographies. And that's what makes them so rich, because he helps us understand the theology uh, in the midst of these, these biographies. And uh, of course, read Edwards, and, and you get it straight. Is there anywhere in particular in Edwards you would suggest that we start? I mean, an awful lot of people know of Edwards and sin is in the hands of an angry God, but I'm not sure that's a particularly representative place to start with Edwards. Where would you suggest? No, I would start with a narrative of surprising conversions. 1735-36, the first uh, revival that Edward saw in, in Northampton. It's a small book. It was reprinted very quickly. In fact, it was printed first, I think, in London before elsewhere. Yeah, that would be a good lead-in. Okay, mm. thank you. Um, perhaps we could just change tack a little bit. Uh, I think it was Wesley who said that a minister should set aside uh, every morning to read and if they can't do that, they should spend at least five hours of every 24 in reading. Um, wh what would you say to young men going into the ministry? Uh, how do you find the time to read? How do you make the time to read? Should you be setting aside a specific time every day? Is that the kind of thing you've done in your own ministries? Well, if you were Wesley, the first thing you did was to buy a horse. Because then with a horse, you, you've got to ride 30 or 40 miles to your engagement. It was a wonderful time to read so we're not we don't quite live the same lives do we you don't ride a great deal John on a horse <laughs> <laughs> so I think it's a good place just to indicate that we while we admire the heroes of a former age it would be a very dangerous thing to use any of them as replicas we've got to think very clearly about where God has put us what our responsibilities are um, and then act from there. Don't start with making a, a series of rules that you've got to do this or that. What do you say about that, John? Well, <clears throat> I think uh, I mean, there's a certain requirement to read in your preparation. Uh, you have to read the text. You, you have to go deeper than reading the text. Uh, in the sermon preparation, I read a text again and again and again until I know what it says. Then I get behind whatever the, the you know I use the New American Standard. I get behind that and I go back to the Greek text and I work things through and I write down um, all, all the observations from the original. Then I go read commentaries. Probably I might read 15 commentaries on any given passage because I don't want to I don't want to miss something. It, it may mean I have to wade through you know six pages uh, commenting on a paragraph or two. Uh, and, and find nothing or find something, but I just don't want to miss anything, and I'm accumulating all of that as I go. So there's that necessary reading, and then when I come across what it is that's in that text that uh, is, is important, maybe it needs a historical setting, so I might draw down something that's going to help me understand that. It, it, it may be a doctrinal issue, so I, I, I want to uh, perhaps elucidate that doctrine by reading something on that doctrine. I, I like to use treasury of scripture knowledge because I like to find other places in the text where this same issue may be dealt with, and I can I can pull that into it. That's that's one constant stream of reading for me that I'm doing. But along with that, I think it's very very important that you be reading things other than what you're actually preparing. 
It's amazing how the Spirit of God will, in that which may appear to be unconnected to your preaching, deliver to you some great, rich insight, uh, illustration, uh, understanding that will connect directly with the preparation that you're doing. And, and that's the providential part of reading that the Spirit of the Lord can direct you in. So uh, I find um, very frequently that I'm reading in an unrelated sense, just whether it's some, some doctrinal book or biographical book or book on history or whatever it might be, I, I find connections that then enrich the sermon preparation uh, as, as the Lord allows something to make it a direct tie-in with what I'm preparing. I'm so glad you added that because it's, it's so important, isn't it? It's a, the, the danger is that when we're constantly facing pulpit, pulpit preparation, that we want material that's directly to the point of what we need, and we do need that material. But if we confine ourselves to that, we are, we're losing something important because the indirect reading, as John was saying, that, that comes in and it affects our, our whole thinking. And uh, on that point, though, I, 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 maybe you were going to bring it up, John. Uh, we need some kind of recall system. If you, I mean, if you're going to read Edwards or any of these Puritans, y you want to have some way in which in the future you can get back to things that really struck you. Um, you don't want to lose the best of your reading. And so I think you know, the, the big books, the big sets, it, the young men have got to get into them when they're young, and they've got to be afraid that if they leave it till they're a little older, they won't start, you know, and get into it young and keep some sort of brief record of things that have helped you and struck you. And I, I can say truthfully that I, uh, things that I need now, I get oftentimes from notes that I wrote maybe 40, 50 years ago, but I, I've got the notes and that saves me. I couldn't even start doing that reading now, but I know where to get things. That, so that recall system is vital, isn't it? Yeah. <clears throat> when, uh, when you asked me to write a chapter for uh, You Must Read, if you haven't read that book, you should read that book. Its title is You Must Read. Uh, you, you asked me to, to, to write how some banner book had affected my life in ministry, and I went back to the two volumes of, uh, of Lloyd-Jones, pulled them off the shelf, and as I always do, I, I read with a pen in my hand. And, and I, I mark in the margins and the bottom of the page, and then I go back to the front of the book, and I write page numbers with a, a, a sort of cryptic message to myself that identifies the subject. So when I wanted to do a review of those books, I pulled those books off the shelf, and I could access everything in there that was important just by that little device of and having certain cues. I don't know if you do this, Ian. A certain kind of mark on the margin mm -hmm. indicates a certain... Because you can't read the whole thing twice, can you? No. Well, I sometimes read a book twice, you know, uh, but, but, but not usually. Usually when I go back to the book, I go back to what I marked. Yeah. So I can find my way back. I, I, I have to manage my own library, and I, I've, I've seen your library in your home, and I know you know where every book is, and I doubt that it uses the Dewey Decimal System. <laughs> I haven't heard of that, no. <laughs> <laughs> so I remember the church decided they wanted to help me by organizing my library. It almost put me out of the ministry. <laughs> Because I already knew where all the books were. Yeah. You know what the red book is next to the blue book, and it's this yeah. short, and it's this tall. You, you all understand that, right? So you, you learn to love and know your library. Yeah. And, uh, and then you mark in those books um, things that are critical, and you can always go back and reaccess that. And isn't it wonderful how men, uh, we, we build a library. I've often thought that to be given a good library, someone else's really good library, it could be a disaster. Libraries and books need to grow with us so that we, we keep pace with our books and, and they, they become lifelong friends. Just to be given a wonderful library, it might be nice to have, but it's not necessarily a blessing. Just an illustration of that. My dad, who was a faithful minister, was basically under the influence of very devotional, um, 
Andrew Murray, A.J. Gordon, all the Keswick kind of um, devotional uh, writers. And um, it was virtually all that. Uh, the only commentaries that I saw early in my life on his shelf were, were, were G. Campbell Morgan, which were a far cry from anything deep in the text, but, you know, were, were wonderful in many ways. Um, and when I started to preach, I couldn't use his library. And um, it, it just needed to go away because it offered me nothing. Uh, toward the end of his life, he began to find more sound material. Uh, but yeah, I, I, my library developed in a completely different way than his. And to say he would have given me his library, he did. He gave me his library and I put it in boxes. Uh, and that's such a good insight. You, you need to grow your library with you. Thank you. That's very helpful. Um, I can attest to the fact that Ian does actually make notes in his books. I have the privilege occasionally to borrow a book from him, uh, and you find that uh, the blank pages at the front or the back of the book are covered in notes and annotations, and as you go through the book, you can see the references to them as you go through. I, I've occasionally had to lend Ian a book too, and, and I kind of hope that when it comes back, it's going to be full of all the notes and it's going to help me, but... Um, <laughs> doesn't generally happen. It's an interesting, uh, Dr. Charles Feinberg was my mentor in seminary, and, and he, he was an amazing guy. Um, he called me into his office just before graduation, and he said, I want to give you a gift. And he gave me his set of Kylan Dalich on the entire Old Testament. And he said, it has all my notes through all the years in the margins. Um, the good news is I got all his notes. The bad news is I have no idea what those markings meant. <laughs> it was so personal to him. But I, but I would labor over something that had some kind of marking because I needed to figure out, you know, why it was important to him. So, so we've touched on a few things there, I think, which are very helpful in terms of understanding your library, building your library, knowing where your books are. And th another thing, don't lose them. Um, put your name in them. Um, books go walking. Um, so that's very helpful things. Yeah, get a label that says stolen from. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but even with the label on, it's amazing. People who wouldn't dream of stealing have no compunction about keeping a book and forgetting who's been wrong. So my method is, if I'm lending a book, and I try not to, but if I... <laughs> If I am lending it, or if I'm borrowing a book from someone else, I try and get a firm decision when that book's going to be returned, or if I've borrowed it, when I promise to let it have back. Because if you don't do something like that, time just goes, and you, then you forget who's got it. And so. Well, thank you. Um, I'll remember that next time you lend me a book. Um, <laughs> I wonder, would you have any advice for people? Uh, I, I find quite often when I'm reading, uh, my mind wanders. Um, and you sometimes get to the end of a page and you think, well, what have I just read? Do you have any advice for people as to how you should read? I mean, do you read standing up, sitting down? Do you ever walk around? Do you ever read out loud, anything like that? Yes. <laughs> All of the above? All of the above. <laughs> um, <clears throat> you know, I think books are intended to make your mind wander but they need to wander in the track that the book is stimulating, not away from the book. Uh, I can't read things like this and just plow through and say, okay, I read that. It's, it's, it's an experience, and I interact with that. And I often tell young preachers, my chair, fortunately, at my desk goes forward and backwards. I can go forward to read, and I can go back to think about what I read. So people say, how fast can you read a book? And I, my answer is, a bad book I can read very fast. A good book takes a whole lot longer because it stimulates the meditation and thought. But if your mind is just wandering off into la-la land, um, you, you need to get out to the garden, he says, <laughs> and smell the flowers. <laughs> Could I just add, in case I forget, it seems to me very important that a friend will come and tell you, look, this is just a tremendous book. You must master it and buy it and read it. Well, and you buy it and you find it's heavy going. It's not just what you want and not very helpful. And then 
10 years later or maybe longer, you pick the book up and it's the right book for you. So one has to be careful about pressing books because we're all at different stages and, and just to say this is the book for you, it may not be, but my experience is if it's a valuable book, a time comes when you suddenly, that's the very book you want. That's a very important yeah. point. You, you can, uh, an illustration of that is <clears throat> I had some books on uh, Rutherford. I hadn't read any of them until you said, we're going to go to en Enwath. We're going to go visit all the places Rutherford was. And I said, I can't show up completely ignorant about <laughs> Rutherford. So I read two books about Rutherford that I had on my shelf for a long time. Yeah, I think it's very helpful. Um, it, we quite often get asked, you know, what are our, our favorite Banner of Truth books? Uh, and we have, you know, 800 or so titles. Uh, and I usually say to people, I don't have a favorite Banner of Truth book. At different points in my life, different books have meant different things to me. Uh, and I think what Ian says there about, uh, you know, a book that you think is wonderful, it may be wonderful because it's speaking to you at a particular time in your life. And the person next door to you may not quite find the same wonder in that book at that point in their life. And uh, just before we turn to some questions, uh, one of the things which I think is very important for ministers is to encourage people to read. Uh, sometimes we're told that we live in a culture where people don't read. Um, and I think it's important we encourage uh, people to read. W would you have any advice about how you go about encouraging your congregations to be readers? I would just say <clears throat> one of the first things I did when I came here Im immediately came in 1969 the parking lot was basically an open field and uh, there was a there were chicken shacks back there it was a chicken farm uh, the the building that you're in right now was the only building originally this this used to have uh, you know just a linoleum floor and shuffleboard and metal chairs and this this was the church and behind us uh, were all these chicken coops and the first thing we did was convert a chicken coop to the Grace Book Shack. So we, we basically uh, converted a chicken coop into a book shack. That's what? It's not in the, bi it's not in the biography, that information. No, but it's, it's true. Uh, well... <laughs> But it's true. That was that was it, literally it was a it was a shack, and we filled it not with anything but with the things that we wanted our people to read. And I remember there was a local Christian bookstore owner who came to me and said, "You are uh, infringing on my business." He was down in the Van Nuys area, and I said to him, "I've been to your bookstore." And I'm, I'd be worried to send my congregation to your bookstore for fear that they would buy something that would be less than beneficial and maybe harmful. I said, for the sake of shepherding my own flock, I want to provide everything I can for them uh, that I think is going to be spiritually beneficial. So that's always been our commitment. And it comes all the way to now and the Grace Book Shack and even the things you're seeing out in the tent in the parking lots. I think as a pastor, you need to have either a library, a book room, some way, and then we feature every Sunday in our, um, our order of service bulletin a book. Week after week after week, we drive our people, and, and not just my books. I mean, occasionally there may be a book. I don't know what the one for this Sunday is, but we keep that in front of people all the time. Um, we encourage our elders to read books uh, because they need to be communicating the benefit of those things and our pastors. So, yeah, I think you have to find every possible way to do that. And I think it helps in your preaching to quote from significant sources so people understand the richness and the value of that. I mean, when you're sitting there and you're listening to the guys this week, you're saying, wow, these guys are well read, right? They're, they're quoting this person and that Puritan and... Um, just that you, you see the richness of, of that in the preaching, don't you? I mean, it's, it just enriches them, and that, that's, that doesn't come without effort. But I think we need to do everything possible to get our people to read, uh, particularly in a time when everything is cryptic, you know, everything is, you know, 127 characters or whatever it is. Um, we need to kind of 
keep people reading, and that's a bit of a challenge. Could I just throw in there that one of the, <coughs> our greatest encouragements when we come to the States is a contrast that we see between the States and Britain. On this point, I don't know how you explain it, but it's not common for our ministers to urge the young people to read good books and to illustrate what a good book is. For some reason, whether they don't want to seem to be old-fashioned or whatever it is, but we don't have real numbers of young people who are eager and interested to read older literature. And I, I, the blame for that lies with the ministers. For some, one reason or another, they're not encouraging them. Whereas here in the States, it's a marvelous thing, and we see it, don't we, John, from the way the books go out. Large numbers of our books are going to young people. And that is because, in, in, as what John has said, it's because they're being pastored and led by preachers who are helping them, and these preachers have advised them on books. And young people who are being helped by ministers will generally follow the lead that they're given. That's why we're very thankful for that. We can see the evidence of it here. Mm. Well, perhaps we could just throw things open if there are anybody who's got any questions. We have a few minutes uh, that uh, we have. So if you have a question, if you'd like to come to the microphone uh, so that we can all hear it. Thanks a lot. I can say for everyone, we thank you for your your service and ministry in Christ. Thank you very much. Uh, my question is, what book would you recommend or what author, both of you gentlemen, for apologetics? If you got to take a tour into your personal library, what would be an apologetic book that you would lean on? Apologetics for what? For scripture or for um, supernaturalism in general or or, or creation or what what i mean the uh, apologetics is a big field isn't it yeah it is i would say um in terms of evangelism what you would hear against the scriptures uh this is not an old book this is a new book i haven't read anything better as a presuppositional apologetic for scripture than john piper's book um the latest book on a peculiar glory. If you haven't read that, you need to read it. What he, what he demonstrates, and he does it out of 2 Corinthians chapter 4, is that the Father has a glory, the Spirit has a glory, the Son has a glory, and the Scripture has a glory. And it's the glory of, it's the glory of God shining in the face of Christ through the revelation of the gospel in Scripture. It, it, he is making the best defense I've read of letting the scripture be its own defense. It has a glory. And if you're an expositor of scripture, you know that. You know that as your people sit under it, they're not looking for some external rational argument to validate the Bible. The Bible validates itself by its own peculiar glory. It's really... Uh, it's really a wonderful book, and, and I, I sent John a, left him a voicemail to say thanks because I, I hadn't read anything that was, and that's where apologetics, from my viewpoint, has to start. It has to start with the defense of Scripture. But the Scripture doesn't need to be defended philosophically. Reason will defend the Scripture, but, but that comes after the Scripture's own defense of itself. Thank you. Hello. Uh, thank you, men, for that. Uh, especially Ian yesterday, that was a great message. And I especially like the exhortation you gave at the front end about uh, reading the scripture. And one thing you mentioned was um, that meditation on the scripture is a lost art. And, uh, and uh, you want ministers to get back to that. Uh, can you make comments about that? And also MacArthur as well, if you have any thoughts on that. I don't think so, except, except I, I'm convinced and convicted myself that I, I, I don't meditate enough, and, and one is the weaker for it. We, we are, one can be in too much of a hurry to read things, to 
when time, quietness, waiting is, is uh, uh, our temperaments come into it. Some of us are less inclined to operate that way, and, and we can be impoverished by it. That, that, that's really what I think. Hmm. No, I haven't any more to say on that. Uh, <clears throat> what helps me meditate on the scripture is to start all sermon preparation early in the week, never beyond Tuesday. Because if I, if I start to put something together on Friday, what is going to be missed is the meditation part. And the worst thing that can happen in this generation is you get on your computer, you start poking around for data, you slap it on pages, and you paste it together and print up a sermon that you have not even internalized. Um, that's one of the reasons I tell people I, I, I write with a pen and I write with a fountain pen because it, I have to stop and fill the ink. That slows me down. Uh, I, I don't want to be in a hurry. I, I don't want to give up. You know, when people say, you know, wh where did you come up with that? And, you know, the simple answer is I think about it. Look, I'm not, I'm not particularly profound, but um, I just think it's critical to go through a process that forces you to internalize what you're saying. What, what that does is by the time I get to the pulpit, this message has captured me. It, I own it. it it's, a, in a sense, like fire in my bones. So that, that meditation isn't just sitting back and letting your mind wander. It's thinking deeply and broadly about a truth that you've read and trying to enrich that truth. Uh, by, meditation is it's not just a blank in your mind. When I meditate on something, it's, I, I start asking questions about it. I start, well, what about this? Well, if that's true, then what about this? My meditation tends to be chasing the answers to questions that something raises in my mind. And once I've satisfied the questions, uh, I can settle down to writing something down about that. So I think meditation has to be the pursuit of a better understanding or application of the truth. And could I just add, on the delivery of sermons, this, this is where it's, it's very vital. Far too many men are tied to notes. They're not really looking at the people. They can't remember what they've prepared. And people who are hearing them won't remember it either. Uh, we have to absor absorb it enough so that we're not tied to paper. We can use no notes, yes, but n not be as dependent upon them. Reading, uh, reading sermons is, n is not a good thing at all. I, I, look at, I look at sermon notes as like landing lights. Yeah, yeah, I like that, yes. yes. Just give me the direction to put this thing down. The only <laughs> to thing land this thing. <laughs> <laughs> So sometimes, uh, sometimes it's better to lose your way in your notes and, and to be free, isn't it? But, uh, but you, I wouldn't like to crash the plane. No. <laughs> no. You know, I was preaching for Eric Alexander in Glasgow. I don't know if you preached in St. George's Tron. You probably have. It's a terrifying pulpit because it's about this big, and it's, it's 30 feet high. And if you drop a note, you're done. <laughs> <laughs> so you're standing there preaching in terror, and there's no borders on the pulpit. So the paper's moving around. So, yeah, you do need to. to you need those landing lights. You, you, yeah, or you you might crash the plane, or worse yet, you you, you can't you can't land it at all. You just keep flying. <laughs> that is terrible. <laughs> that is the worst of all. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, what's the role of uh, different types of literature, so say fiction or MacArthur, Dr. MacArthur, you've been preaching uh, recently and you've referenced the, the book on cancer. Uh, so do you read different types of books differently and uh, what would be the role of different types of literature? Yeah, I really rarely ever read fiction. Um, fiction is a form of entertainment and uh, I, I don't really have the time to drag out entertainment that long. Uh, so. Um, I rarely read fiction. I might read, um, I, I might, you know, I might read C.S. Lewis or something like that, or, you know, like Bunyan, or, um, but I don't, I don't do that much anymore. I, so I don't read fiction. But 
Um, I, I do read things that help me understand the world. And the reason I, I read the book, The Emperor of All Maladies, and it's a very long book, and I think I'm about 800 pages in, it's the history of cancer. is It's a brilliant book. It's a it's a Pulitzer Prize book. It's a it's a phenomenal book written by Mukherjee, who's an Indian um, medical doctor, a brilliant brilliant writer. What fascinates me about the book is his conclusion. When I heard what the conclusion was, why I wanted to read it, his conclusion is cancer can never be cured. All the efforts of the cancer societies all over the world, cancer can never be cured. His conclusion is we can mitigate it, we can do this and that, but there's something going on in the human life that leads to death. He is a staunch evolutionist, and he can't explain why we're all dying, but he knows it's incurable. It's brilliantly written, fascinating. The complexity of corruption to, to understand the impact of depravity at a level you've never even thought about it, at the level of uh, the cell, it's an amazing book. He has a second book I'm reading now called DNA. It's the history of DNA. You know, it wasn't until the end of the, well, really the end of the 19th century that anybody knew why people were sick. Nobody could deny, diagnose anything because they didn't understand pathology of disease at all. And he follows the whole trail of DNA, which is an incredibly interesting history. And he comes to the complexity of DNA <clears throat> and then hangs on to his evolutionary atheism. It's like you can't be that idiotic. You can't, you can't have 600 pages on this uh, unbelievably complex structure and then say it all happened because because of nothing. But I, I'm fascinated by that. I want to better understand the world I live in. I'm fascinated sometimes to read um, uh, astronomy. The, the microcosm fascinates me. The macrocosm fascinates me because I see the hand of God in all of it. And I understand my world. Um, I like to be able to figure things out. I'm not content not to know why something is the way it is. So that uh, motivates some of that. Um, I, I recently read a book, and I, I don't recommend you read it. The, the title of it is Gosnell. It's the story of an abortionist in, in Philadelphia who is the, the greatest, probably the greatest serial killer the world has ever known. Uh, in the name of, uh, of legitimate abortion, just massacring babies, even after they're born, beheading them. And, and again, all of this is given legitimacy in, in our society, in our culture, and it speaks to the depth of this horror of sin that's been unleashed in the world. I, I couldn't finish it. I got three quarters through it, and it was just too uh, horrific. Uh, but again, um, it, it speaks to me of the realities of sin. And the, in, the, the unwillingness of the government in that place, that location, the, the people in power uh, to, to turn the other way and never do anything about this massacre of slaughter of these people, these little infants. Some women are having nine abortions. Their lives are just absolute disasters because of guilt. And so, you know, sometimes um, that's a morbid thing. I don't always read things that are that morbid, but... Um, some of those things help me understand the world I live in better. Thank you. Uh, I'm afraid we're running out of time, so I apologize to the two gentlemen who are looking to ask a question. Um, I, I, I'm sure you'll want me to uh, thank Dr. MacArthur and Reverend Murray for being with us this morning, um, and I trust that you found it helpful uh, and informative, um, and something, you know, there will be things here that you can take away with you into your future ministries uh, that will help you.